Welcome, folks. I want to explain what zigzag persistent homology might have to do with uh, evasion paths in mobile sensor networks. So we were considering this problem where sensors are moving in this bounded domain, and we have sensors on the, on the very boundary, which aren't moving, but the sensors in the interior might be moving. And we want to ask, is it possible for an intruder to move continuously and never be seen by these sensors? So can you move continuously and never be hit by one of these blue balls? Okay, is the question we're trying to answer. If the sensor is measured, there's GPS, their GPS coordinates, just look at the video of how the sensors are moving and you can decide. But what if the sensors only measure connectivity information? So when two sensors are overlapping, we just measure this edge, or when three sensible intersection, we, we measure this triangle of three pointed intersection. All right, so, you know, we'll draw pictures in space cross time where my planar domain is, is uh, this, this oval and then time is moving from left to right. And the gray covered region in space time is covered by the sensors. And the white region is the uncovered region where an intruder can move continuously here and evade the sensors. But in this example, an intruder couldn't continuously evade the sensors because you can't teleport. All right, so my goal was to try to find an if and only if criterion for deciding if uh, an evasion path existed. And the idea that I wanted to employ was called zigzag persistence. It's a good idea to try to use it. We'll find out that it's not, not quite strong enough. So what is zigzag persistence? In zigzag persistence, you track holes, okay, just like you do in persistent homology, but you track holes when the space is allowed to get larger or smaller. In persistent homology, the space only ever gets larger, but in zigzag the persistence, the space can get larger or smaller. So think of the spaces as almost these slices, right? And the slices, as time changes, can get larger or smaller. Um, I'll make that more precise. But what zigzag persistence is tracking here is there's one hole, and then in this example, there's two holes where you know they uh, occupy the same time portions, but no hole persists from the very start to the very end, right? And you, you would guess that the zigzag barcodes in this last example would, would be these three bars. You know, we have one hole here. Then if we make a slice right there, we have two holes. If we make a slice right here, we have three holes, et cetera. So my hypothesis was that zigzag persistence would decide if there's an evasion path. And the hope was that there's an evasion path if and only if there's a bar in the zigzag persistence barcode that started at the very beginning and ended at the very end. So the hope was we could use that to decide there is an evasion path in this first example, no evasion path in the second example because there's no bar that goes from the very start to the very end. And the hope was that there'd be no evasion path uh, in this third example because there's no bar that goes from the very start to the very end. Indeed, there is no evasion path in this last example because you can't move backwards in time when following this S-shaped curve. So to say a little bit more about zigzag persistence and how you can use it here, take your covered region in space cross time and chop up time into bits, okay? So we've subdivided time. Now include each slice in time into the next interval in time, which contains the next slice in time, which includes into the next interval in time, etc. cetera, okay? So you see how, how we have a small space including into a larger one, which contains a smaller space, includes into a larger one, et cetera. So this is how our space is not just growing, but our space is growing and then getting smaller, growing and then getting smaller, growing and then getting smaller. And you can still compute an analog of persistent homology here. It's called zigzag persistent homology. So not only do you count the number of holes in each space, right? This space has one hole, two holes, three holes, two holes, and one hole, you know, and you can count the, the holes in these slices too. But you use the structure of, of being, um, I don't know, 
vector spaces and, and satisfying functoriality to link up the number of holes in each space into bars. So we saw how we went from one hole to two to three, back down to two, and then back down to one. But furthermore, zigzag persistent homology shows how those holes link together. Okay. And for this particular example, we have one long bar from start to end corresponding to this hole. And then we have two shorter bars corresponding to you know, this hole that juts off for a bit and this hole that juts off for a bit. Those aren't holes in 3D, but they are holes in 2D when you take slices in time, right? I do have three holes here when I slice at that time. And that's why I have three bars right here. So that's what zigzag persistent homology measures. It's very nice that the, the math works out that you can track these holes, not only as a space gets larger, but also as it gets larger and then smaller again. However, zigzag persistence is more counterintuitive than persistent homology. In persistent homology, I could show an expert a growing sequence of spaces and ask them to, to draw the, ball, the bars and they would get it right every time. Zigzag persistence, when a space gets larger and smaller, if you ask an expert to draw uh, the bars, myself included, will sometimes get it wrong. It's a little bit more counterintuitive. You can make this all computational if you discretize things in time and in, in, and in space. Okay. So the upshot is that you can use zigzag persistence to get the following theorem. If there's an evasion path, then there's a full length bar. But unfortunately, this is not an if and only if criterion. So I lied to you when I drew these bars in blue on top, which are now crossed out. These are the incorrect bars for this example. The correct bars are actually drawn below. I'll give you two explanations for those correct bars. Um, maybe one in this video and, and one in our next video next time. This is what I'm saying, how zigzag persistence is a little bit more counterintuitive. I sort of maybe pulled the wool over your eyes and you believed me these were the correct bars when they weren't. So this example on the right is one in which there's no evasion path, even though there is a full length bar. Right? So this, this isn't an if and only if criterion. If there's no full length path, then there's no evasion path. Right? but you might have a full length bar and still have no evasion path. You can use this to get a streaming one-sided criterion, right? So when we were talking about the blue sheet alpha in the last video, you needed to store your entire sensor network over all time. The nice thing about this zigzag persistence criterion is that you're computing things in slices. So you can throw away part of the network that you computed um, at prior times when you're at a later time in the computation. Okay, I owe you two explanations for these counterintuitive bars. One explanation will be next time. But another explanation is just to show you generators for these bars. So this long green bar is generated by the loop in green, which maps to itself consistently in all these slices. And then the short red bar corresponds to this loop, which in some sense wraps around two holes, right? And then the short blue bar corresponds to this blue loop, which in some sense wraps around two holes right there. So this is just one explanation for these counterintuitive bars. And I'll give you another one in the following video. So to end, Zigzag persistent homology is a nice idea here. It gives you a one-sided criterion. You can use zigzag persistence to guarantee there's no evasion path if there's no full length bar. And in other words, if there is evasion path, then there is a full length bar, but it doesn't resolve every situation. The situation on the right is one in which there's no evasion path, but we can't use zigzag persistence to guarantee that. So this criterion is no stronger than the, the criterion we saw in the last video using the blue sheet alpha, but, um, but maybe it's a little bit more computationally efficient. Any public questions?
Thanks so much.